Well, you see the, the topic. So we're going to leave behind our static fluids. We're still talking about fluid statics. This is the last class that we'll talk about fluid statics. But now we're going to throw back in the terms that we've always thrown out, the acceleration terms. Um, and of course, an earthquake has accelerations. It's a, an acceleration one direction, then a, a reverse acceleration or a deceleration. And uh, this is the Mineral Springs earthquake, which certainly occurred in your lifetime. And I felt it in my office in Pennsylvania. I think it was 2011, if I look at the, the date on this. And it's a bit gentle, wasn't it? wasn't as huge as the, the California Brawley earthquake you saw there, magnitude uh, 7.2. But I think this was a high fives or six. And of course, it matters how close to the uh, epicenter you are. And it was in Mineral Springs, Virginia, I believe. So we're not very close to that. And so this gentle rocking that you see is because of the excitation. Uh, this is a pool in Virginia. Um, didn't damage anything here. It uh, knocked a few gargoyles off the National Cathedral in DC. It closed the uh, Washington Monument for a couple of years for cr cracks and repairs. Um, and uh, so earthquakes are seldom on this uh, side of the country, the stable crust, but they do occur and they certainly have occurred based on um, uh, injection of wastewater from things like shale, shale gas development. But they aren't, uh, certainly are not as common as they are in uh, California, where tectonically they occur along the plate boundary, or even in places like Oklahoma, where there's been a resurgence based on oil and gas in the last few years in developing um, depleted uh, oil reservoirs, where maybe 10% of the fluid you take out is oil, 90% of the fluid you take out is water, and the water is brine, non-potable, and you have to do something about it. And so typically you, you re-inject it. So we've seen this before as well. Um, and that is uh, water that's caught within the, uh, the air gap between double glazing on a bus. And uh, from the outside, uh, from the scenery outside, you can see what happens uh, to the, the motion of the bus. And that is, as you accelerate, it's like bulldozing the water in front of you. It piles up. When you decelerate, it goes the opposite direction. And of course, that's uh, related to the accelerations that are going on. So it all seems kind of ex oxymoronic, the fact that we're talking about accelerations in static fluids, right? But the, the idea is that the fluid is in a container. The fluid isn't circulating or traveling like it would be in Bernoulli type flow, but it's stuck in a container. And the mere fact that if I run across the room with my coffee cup uh, from left to right, a constant velocity, nothing happens. But when I accelerate, uh, this always responds to the acceleration. And you can see it quite nicely here. And so actually, uh, we could think about whether we could use this um, meter to be able to chart the acceleration and deceleration of the bus. I think we can. And so we'll explore that as we go on to, uh, to talk about that today. And so I think that's kind of a, a cool example. I think it might have been supplied by someone in this class many, many moons ago. Uh, the other reason for wanting to do this is for practical reasons. Um, and uh, centrifugal pumps or centri centripetal pumps work on that idea. You have some flat blades. Uh, radially outwards on, on a hub or curved blades that spin. When they spin, they fling the water out to the side. And as they fling the water out to the side, they create low pressure in the middle, which sucks fluid into, into the pump. And so it's a, a viable way in which you can actually move fluids by doing that. So we can think of two particular uh, kinds of um, accelerations. They are linear accelerations that we looked at from the bus. And they are centrifugal accelerations that we look at uh, in these pumps. So that's what we'll, we'll talk about uh, today. Uh, where else do we need to go? All right. So 801, that's our plan. Um, we, I guess the other thing we looked at, and I'll circle this. 
We looked at these before. Someone's been drawing on them. Actually, that's not a bad case. And we also talked about these. If you go up by, the, by Rockview Prison, Dale Summit, there's a siding that goes, brings in stuff to what was the Center Daily Times office there and was Asahi, um, which used to make TV cathode ray tubes um, in State College. And sometimes there are tra trucks, tanker trucks parked on that siding. And sometimes they're flared with the ends, uh, both ends flared upwards. Uh, and we talked about that, the fact that if you think about bulldozing fluids, that you push it so it has a gradient to it, then the reason for this is that this extra headspace here can accommodate the volume of fluid without popping the top off. And so it's a safety measure to be able to accommodate that. And so we need to understand something a little bit about um, uh, accelerations in fluids. So that's what we plan to do today. Okay. So this is our topic. I think we'll probably use this. All right. So, so just to, to recap, you remember that before, um, what we had done, we had dealt with uh, a series of expressions. And those are the expressions that are above here. We can write them in somewhat compact form. We wrote them slightly differently, maybe. but. Always, what we've done so far is we've assumed that these terms are equal to zero. And if those terms, the accelerations, uh, and these are accelerations applied to the container, if you like, so the container moves, it already has gravity applied to, to, the, to acceleration, then um, the resulting equations become quite straightforward. They say that as you go horizontally in a fluid, so long as you're connected to it, then the pressure change is zero if you don't go up in elevation. And if you do go up in elevation, the pressure change with elevation is equal to the unit weight, uh, scales with the unit weight. And we can integrate this expression and we can get the fact that uh, the change in pressure equals rho g h, where h is the, the distance in, in height. So those are the equations that we've used um, so far up to this point. If we choose not to throw these terms away, then all of a sudden we have to deal with them. And you can imagine, well, you don't need to imagine, we can write them out. So we can write out this, these full terms in the form that we would want to deal with them. And they come out, if we write them in, we wrote them in reverse order the other time because we started with the z direction acceleration first. But if we write them in normal mode, then they come out to be something like, I'm going to just write, write them from this. So it'd be minus dp dx. There's a zero term. Uh, it's equal to rho ax, acceleration x direction. For the second term, pressure change in the y direction minus zero equals the density times acceleration in y. My writing's not very good, so I'll put my... And the final term, the one that we spent most time on, has a z, it's a negative. We have an extra term in here. I'll write it out as rho g is equal to rho az. So in all of these, just to remind yourselves of the idea of the control volume, it's a, a static fluid that's sitting inside a bucket. Bucket happens to be, well, a bucket can be any shape, of course. But these accelerations, as we drew last time, this would be acceleration in the z direction, because in all of these, we're applying our right-hand rule, thumb, x, first finger, y, uh, second finger, z, I'm not sure which ones are indexed, etc. And so we'll always conform to that. The x and y aren't particularly important. But what is important is the fact that z acts upwards in everything we've done so far. Grabbing my pen wrong. x and y. And so we can imagine accelerations being applied in each of the directions as we want them. So the acceleration in x would be this. And of course, gravity acts through this anyway. So this is terms. 
So what we had done is we'd assumed that these were zero, and we could throw them away, and we ended up with these expressions here. But what we'd like to do maybe is not assume that and think about what would happen in our container. And so if we have a container that maybe is closed, it doesn't need to be closed, um, we could think about two of the directions at one time. Let me see what I do the uh, calculations in later. I think in terms of y. Yeah, let's, let's use y. So let's use um, y is horizontally and z is vertically. Uh, I'm only doing this because I'm going to turn off the acceleration at x and just have it in one linear horizontal direction to make life easier. So that kind of says to us, well, we could take this expression here, and it says that if we look at the pressure change along the base here, uh, let me draw it as the pressure would change. If this was, uh, the vertical axis was pressure, and this was the distribution, we know that from this equation that dp dy is equal to rho a y. There's a minus sign in there. So this. So in other words, if we apply a positive acceleration to this, we end up with a gradient of pressure along the base, which is equal to a rate of change of an incremental change of pressure with an incremental change in y. y is positive in this direction. This is a negative gradient, right? Positive gradient would be up to, the, to 2 o'clock. Negative gradient would be down to 4 o'clock, uh, just from the conventions. And so the pressure distribution along the base of this, if this was closed in, bless you, was, was equal to this. So that's fine. So that's if this is closed in. Uh, it would also tell us that if we looked at the same geometry, and I can draw it here, and in that same geometry, if we also kind of closed it in, that if we now accelerate it upwards at some velocity, then we could use this expression here. And so if we draw pressure versus depth, then this pressure here would be equal to dp dz. I'm taking this bottom equation here is equal to rho, I'm just going to move this onto the left hand side, rho a sub z plus g and negative because it's increasing as you go downwards. So this would be positive z, this would be negative z, and this would be the pressure distribution that we've talked about. and it's just given by this term. So what it says is that we're in, used to seeing it in a static case where the magnitude of this pressure distribution, there's no acceleration applied. So this is acceleration in the z direction. Positive is upwards, opposite to gravity. So if there is no acceleration, then this term goes to zero, and this just becomes our normal distribution that you'd see if you went down the swimming pool. But if this is accelerating, so if this is not the case, then the magnitude of this you'd expect to be increased by some amount. And so this, it would look like this if uh, az is uh, greater than zero, positive. And it would look like this if az is less than zero, right? Because we're adding it on. Makes perfect sense. So, of course, this one, the, the red curve is due to gravity. So it's the normal stress that you, or increase in pressure you feel if you're in a swimming pool. If you apply a negative acceleration to it, which is equal to gravity, so in other words, if you're free falling, if you're unfortunate enough to have your elevator cord cut when you've got your coffee in your hand in the elevator, then you, your coffee, all the blood in your organs, would essentially feel zero gravity. The pressure distribution in your body, the pressure distribution in your cup would be zero. And of course, if there was a, um, a rocket applied to the top of the elevator to push you down faster than free fall, then 
you'd end up on, on this side with a negative pressure. So, so directly from these, we can consider those behaviors for, if you like, closed systems. So acceleration in the z direction, acceleration in the y direction, and here we're thinking that the, maybe the top of this is closed. So think of this as a closed system that we can do this in. If the system is open, then like your cup of coffee, it has a free surface. And if I ran across the front of the room with a cup of coffee in a transparent container, you'd be able to see an elevation change within that, uh, within that cup. And so the other geometry we can look at, which is useful, is open. And I should probably have uh, presaged these to talk about these are linear accelerations. If you hadn't guessed. And what we can do uh, is if we look at an, an open container, in this open container, we can apply the same behavior to it. Maybe we can apply an acceleration in the y direction. And so I guess we'd expect that if we start off with a, a level in it, then that level becomes slightly different. We draw our coordinate systems as before as z and y. This, oh, that's too big. This gradient here would be equal to dy dz. And the question is, what is that gradient? I suppose other ancillary questions we could ask ourselves, what would the pressure distribution be on the back side of this? Might be a question we have to ask. Or the front side. Presumably on the front side it would look like this, right? Just as we go down. And so the question is, how do we figure out exactly what this uh, boundary condition on the surface would be? And it's pretty straightforward. We know that the pressure on this surface has to be equal to zero, or atmospheric, compared to the fluid. Um, and so we know that as we go uh, across here, all points on this surface should be zero. And we can look at the change in pressure as we go along it. So as we go from this point to this point, the change in pressure between those two points is zero because they're both at atmospheric pressure. Okay? So we can use this kind of mathematical sleight of hand to say that dp is equal to dp plus dp plus dp seems strange, that seems like that's three dps. But if they're all, the directions that we're going in are all orthogonal to each other, then we know that if force is resolved in one direction orthogonal to another, it has no influence. And so what we could do is we could multiply each one of these by uh, dx over dx, dy over dy, and dz over dz. And if we write that out in slightly different longhand, this, then this would be dp dx. Uh, I guess I'll keep it in um, ODEs, doesn't really matter. dp dx dp dy dy plus dp dz dz. And you realize that we now have terms which are this. We said that from going from here to here, then dp equals zero, because they're the same. So we can set this equal to zero. And if I make this slightly smaller so you can see it, maybe you can't see it, then I can drag down these different relations here. We have dp dx. This is equal to um, rho ax negative. This is equal to minus 
rho ay, and this is equal to, I'm going to make it bigger in a minute, minus rho az plus g. Right? All I'm doing is taking these individual components and substituting them in for this here. And so what we can do is let's uh, put a acceleration in the x direction equal to zero. That's acceleration into the page. And so let's forget this. So we have an expression that looks something like uh, minus rho a y dy minus rho a z plus gravity times dz. We could set those equal to each other. So if I modify that, so if I set them equal, I, I may, I'll, con I'll confuse you by modifying it. What we can do is we can separate out these two terms here. So if we separate this out, I know the solution. It should be dz over dy is equal to minus uh, ay over az plus g. And so all I'm doing is rearranging this thing as, I guess, uh, if I got rid of everything else, you know, what it would look like is I'd get rid of this. Uh, these would be equal to zero. Uh, this would be equal to, to minus z. And then I'm just rearranging for dividing both sides through by dy. supposed to be 1, uh, and taking, dividing both sides through by rho az plus g. Very simple. az plus g. Yeah. Spending too long doing it, but you get the idea. And this goes to be 1. And so that becomes a fundamental expression. It's, it's marked in the top of this sheet if, you, if we go back there. And it's useful for us to look at. So if you go back here, I didn't point it out at the time, but it's kind of a standard result that comes out of this. It basically, it's in x but in this particular case, but you can substitute x for y because we've used that congruent with the other notes. It's negative, so in other words, you're accelerating towards uh, your left. I guess it's backwards. You're accelerating in one direction, and as a result of that, the slope that you get is in the opposite direction. And so what we can do is we can say something about the elevation of the slope. So as the acceleration becomes larger, the slope becomes steeper. If the acceleration is in the opposite direction, negative, it'll cant over in the opposite direction, obviously. Um, and if, in this particular case, uh, I guess you should point out the fact that in this particular case, we're assuming that the acceleration in the z direction is zero. So in other words, if this was just running along on rollers on a horizontal surface, then this term here would be equal to zero, and we wouldn't want to worry about it. And so I guess for the bus example, we could go back to that, because certainly the bus is kind of on a horizontal plane. It's equal to minus acceleration in the direction the bus is going, divided by g. I think this, I don't know what this gradient was. It looked like it was half of the order of a half. So if this is an order of a half, then this is equal to um, 4.81 meters a second, or 4.8, I guess, divided by 9. 4.9, isn't it? My math's not so good. This is equal to 9.81 over 2 divided by 9.81 gravity. Right? And so we know that that's something of the order. So this, this term here, the acceleration y is something like um, 4.9 meters per second squared. So it's kind of cool that you can use the elevation of the, um, the water in the gap between this, the double glazed 
uh, window to say something about exactly what's going on. Uh, you can use it. And we know that when the bus slows down, it piles up at the front end of the, of the screen as it's going, and it comes to be a similar amount. But we can use that to be able to calculate the, um, the acceleration. So what else uh, do we know from this? Well, we know that if it rises on the back of this trolley, then uh, this has to be zero pressure. We know that from this expression up here, if I remove some of the extra stuff, we know that from this expression here that we can get the pressure distribution with elevation. If the z-acceleration is zero, in other words, if it's just going horizontally without going upwards, then we know that this term drops out and that this pressure distribution should merely be the pressure distribution in a static fluid, a truly static fluid, one that's not accelerating to the left or right. It would just be the linear distribution that's to that. Likewise, on the other side, the only thing is that the interface, where it interfaces with the free surface, where it's hydrostat, where it's atmospheric, then that has to be zero pressure gauge and that it has to increase from then. Likewise, I guess, as in the case before, if you can imagine the case where you would also give it an acceleration in the z direction, then that wouldn't be the case. Uh, if you give it also an acceleration in the z direction, then this behavior will happen because we we're not able to get rid of this particular term. And so, quite straightforwardly, I think you can imagine that in the case where you have acceleration in the vertical direction, then if it's vertically upwards, then the gradient's going to be larger for each of these, but it will still go through atmospheric at this point because it's a boundary condition. And if it's accelerating downwards, acceleration is negative, then the same would happen as in the case that we talked about up here. Okay? That's, that's kind of cool. So I think it's interesting. So it's not completely oxymoronic that we're talking about accelerating fluids. The idea is that the fluid is contained within a beaker or, or, or a, a container and can't flow. It's not flowing like Bernoulli, it's, it's essentially remaining static. So when you start moving this thing across the page, well clearly the water that is here has to go somewhere, it goes down here, and so it might readjust in some way, but it's not flowing. It's just like we talked about waves when you've talked about um, fluid statics, and of course you know that a wave isn't rushing on shore when it goes on shore. A wave is just a circulation that's kind of underneath it. And so the water that starts off at this point stays at this point. It just moves backwards and forwards. It doesn't all of a sudden end up running up on the shore. Okay? So, so I think that's cool. Uh, I like it. So let's go back to the movies. Let's just look at what we had before. And so we don't need to look at this. Um, so just to remind you, if you came in late, uh, you shouldn't have done, of course, but uh, this is our bus, and this is the water level. I don't know if it's, perhaps it's less than a half. Um, and so it's probably less than 4.9 meters per second squared, but you, well, that's not, not far off. Maybe it's a quarter. I don't know. You can work that out for yourself. But anyway, you can use that to gauge the accelerations uh, as you drive on a bus, should you be lucky enough to have a bus that has water in it. We made the case uh, when we came in at the beginning of class that centrifugal pumps are kind of useful pieces of equipment because they allow us to be able to, to pump. The principle is that it relies on circulation. Of course, this water is flu flowing, and so the things that we'll talk about today don't exactly apply but it gives reason for us to think about these kinds of uh, machines. And the mechanism is that these blades uh, turn around, they drag the water with it. Because they're angled, they fling the water out to the side by centripetal force. And if fluid has been thrown out to the side, then it doesn't exist in the middle, so it has to replace that with fluid that's dragged along the pipe to fill that void. So we have continuity of mass, that we don't end up with a, uh, an airspace developing. And so that's how centrifugal pumps work. And so the principle for fluid statics, uh, we can give in this kind of hokey um, description here. I'll play it, and I'll play it with a volume on. It'll echo. I won't speak over it. But you can do 
right at home. A little bit, I'm just hanging little bit grade school. A solar centric system, and going over today's science file. Oh, and today's science file, let says, why don't the planets get? Po so I'll let it run. But basically, I could take a um, a string with a weight on it, and I could twirl it around my head like a bolus. The fluids that we talked about, remember we used F equals MA to describe all the equations we have so far. It doesn't really matter if it's a fluid or a block of rock, an apple falling out of a tree, uh, or a big raindrop falling out of a tree, really are governed by the same equations. And so uh, this is obviously dealing with a solid, but it's the same physical relationship. And it relies also on F equals MA, but F equals mass times acceleration, the acceleration is uh, rotational acceleration. And so when you swing this around, he's using it to make the point that the some force is applied along the length of the string because it lifts up the coffee cup uh, in resisting it. And so that is in response to um, the motion of the weight around it. And we know that F equals MA acceleration is rate of change of velocity. So it's meters per second squared. And we always think of velocity as a, as a speed. But velocity as a speed, velocity is a vector, right? So it has speed and direction. So you can either change the speed, go less fast or, or, or more fast, or you can change direction. And if you change direction, it's a, an angular acceleration. And so when you spin something around your head, it's going at the same speed, rotational speed all the time, but to be able to keep from going in a straight line, you have to pull it in to be able to, to maneuver it. And so it's the direction that's changing that gives it an acceleration. So that's kind of where we're going now. I always debate over whether I should do these derivations, and I'm not going to do the derivations today. If you want to look at the derivations for this, uh, look at last year's uh, video, perhaps, or previous videos. I'm just going to give it a break this year. I'm never quite sure how useful the derivations are. These are the derivations we've already gone through today. This is exactly what we've talked about already. Um, and, but this is now our new topic. So we'll talk about rotational acceleration. And so if you look at this, um, I'll make the point just above this. Uh, I'll, I'm going to use this. And so all we'll do today is we'll talk about rotational acceleration, go through a quick example, and that, that'll be us done. And so if we're talking about rotational acceleration, my shorthand for acceleration. You'll remember that the expressions we had before, let me just go back here, because I think they're arranged in that way. You'll remember that this these expressions came purely from looking at uh, Newton's second law, F equals MA. Everything on the left-hand side is a force. It's a force that's due to a pressure gradient or due to uh, gravity acting. And the right-hand side is an acceleration multiplied by a mass. Of course, we could uh, multiply this by a volume and multiply all sides by volumes if we wanted to. And a mass times a volume, sorry, a density times a volume is equal to a mass. So that's where it comes from. So my only point for noting that is that if we're looking at rotational acceleration, then we can write Newton's law in rotational frame as mass times an angular acceleration. And the angular acceleration we can write as uh, angular velocity squared divided by a radius. And so. This is the velocity that the weight would be going as you throw it around your head, the speed, if you like, in terms of meters per second. It's changing direction all the time to keep from going in a straight line because it's going in a circular trajectory. And, well, we can't take this. I'm not going to drive this, but we can certainly check the units, right? Velocity squared is meters per second squared and over meters. And so it certainly equals meters per second squared. So it has the right units, so it has a chance of, of being right. Uh, 
And this basically comes from the fact that if you're looking at um, a trajectory, let's see how good a, a drawing I can do. Will it correct itself? Ah. If uh, the trajectory that you're going on is conforms to this system, this is radius, this is the direction of V theta. And of course, the reason for theta is that if you look at the, the tangent here, that this is an angle which is theta. It has to rewrite itself through theta every certain part of its track that it goes through. And so certainly this speed as it goes around here is constant, doesn't change. But the direction it's going through does change because it has to alter uh, periodically. And so what we can do is we can write a set of equations that are actually very similar to the ones that we had already in terms of f equals ma by taking a little control volume. And I'm not going to drive these, but the control volume would be at the end of this. And it'd be a little differential cube. If you can see the cube, not doing it very well can make it bigger, I guess, for you. And the fact is that this volume happens to be fluid that is being swept around. So it's going at some velocity in the theta direction here. And we could imagine forces being applied towards the center, the taut string that's pulling on it, that ends up pulling up the weight. And also we could think about accelerating it in the vertical direction. So if we took this equation, F equals ma, and we went through the pain of deriving this, we'd come up with these equations. So these equations are the same as we had before, which are really in terms of z, y, and x, kind of. It's still a right-handed coordinate system. You can think of the right-handed coordinate system as being uh, this, with a manifestation of it on the end of this um, um, weight that's, that's, that's sent. And these allow us to uh, determine what the pressure change is with radius, the pressure change is with um, azimuth, as you go around the, the uh, with angle around the central location here, and the change with z as we go in here. So immediately we notice some similarities, right, with what we've had. The pressure change with elevation looks very similar to what we had before. It's equal to the unit weight of the fluid. It's exactly the same as for the static case. So this is saying, in this case, we're not actually giving it an acceleration in the z direction. So all we're, we're not accelerating this. We're allowing it to self-accelerate by being in the container that is being turned. So it's representing, if you like, a beaker that has an axis on it that is turning on that axis. You can imagine what happens with that beaker. You'd think that the water would be thrown out to the uh, to the sides, just like the wall of death in the, uh, in the circus, uh, where you stick attached to the wall. Or the tilt and whirl, I guess, is the same, a slightly more um, a modest version of that. The pressure change with um, azimuth. So as we track around this uh, volume, all that's saying, you could think of it that the pressure doesn't change as you go around it. And I guess the manifestation of that is that if you follow the surface, You'd expect that if you followed the surface, you took a snapshot of this thing at time, and you followed the surface around from one point with a constant radius back on yourself again, you'd expect that there's no jump. So the fact that there's no jump means that there has to be no gradient to this surface, which is really what this is saying. And I guess the other thing is that saying that the pressure change with radius is not now um, zero, but it's a function of r. And so it's a function of the constant rotational speed that you apply to it, the density of the fluid, and the radius. So in other words, if you drew what the pressure distribution looked like, I suppose it would look something like this, right? It would be nonlinear. At this point here, r equals 0, the pressure gradient is 0, flat. As you go out from that, then as radius increases, so you, you'll increase. It, uh, it changes linearly with radius. So I guess, um, yeah. So this is the rate of pressure change with R, not the pressure change. And so the pressure change is what I've drawn here. The rate of pressure change would be constant. It'd be a straight line. 
but that means that the pressure change, because the rate of change is increasing, uh, is increasing exponentially. We'll see that in a minute, because you'd have to integrate this, right? So those are the fundamental equations that we had. So what we might want to do is we might want to figure out exactly what the trajectory of this surface is as it spins around. So what we can do is we can use the same trick as before. We can write the change, we notice that the change in pressure on this surface is zero as we go from all these different points because it's atmospheric. And so we could write the change in pressure being equal to the change in pressure plus the change in pressure plus the change in pressure. We could multiply each of these by one over one for the different coordinates, radius, uh, angular location, and elevation. So I'll get rid of my markings on that. And I suppose we have each of these. This is dpdr. This is dpd theta. That's zero. And this is this. So we know that this is equal to zero because we've said that on this surface, as we go across it, it has to be equal to zero. And so we can set it equal to zero. We've substituted the values for each of these grad gradients of pressure in the directions. And so now we can do is what we had before. So left-hand side, two terms are left are equal to zero. And the, of those two terms, we like to be able to define what the orientation of the surface is. We know that the orientation of this surface, if I draw it out here, if I extend it, the orientation of this surface, just to be clear, is equal to dz dr. We have to be careful about our sign convention because radius is um, linearly outwards on both directions. So positive r is in each of these directions. It's axisymmetric. And so if we have each of these, we can just re rearrange it in terms of this divided by this. So I guess we divide by dr and dr, etc. And if we do that, we end up with this expression. The change in elevation of the surface is equal to the radius, the, the angular velocity squared. So this is in radians per second. This would be in rads per second. Um, and the rate of change of elevation varies with r. And so where r is equal to 0, this rate of change would be 0. And so that says that in the middle, this would be a flat surface. So r equals 0 is a flat surface here. But as we go out, this gradient increases. And again, the same point about the pressure distribution. The gradient of pressure is linear in r. And so if we drew dp dr, this is p, not density, is equal to, is a function of r times rho times omega squared. All that matters is it's a linear function of this. So as you go one meter out here, you go up some amount. You go two meters out here, you go double that amount. But the pressure gradient that results, that, that's the pressure gradient. We want actually the pressure. So if we wanted the pressure to be able to figure out what the pressure was that was acting on here, we still have to do something with that expression to figure out. And of course, what we'll do with it is integrate it, right? So if you take this expression here, we could integrate for the surface. And just by moving r onto the right-hand side, we integrate it, and we end up with elevation is a function of radius, some constants, which would be gravity and the speed that you're accelerating it, rotating it at. Uh, and if we don't integrate between limits, we end up with a constant here. And so if we want to do that, then you just uh, you figure out what your constant is by writing your equation at r equals 0. If r equals 0 and you know what z is, and you know that r is equal to 0, immediately you have constant. And then you can use it to calculate what the elevation is at some other point. Okay? So that is a way, and we'll do an example before we finish, um, just quickly. That is a way to be able to get that surface. If we want to also come back to work out what the pressure distribution is along the base, what we could do is we could take this relationship here and integrate this directly against radius to get the pressure distribution. 
And if we do this, uh, this is the expression here. I won't go through it. But you end up with the pressure being equal to density, rotational velocity, rotational rate squared, and r squared. The unit weight of depth, this is just the swimming pool equation, right? As you go down in elevation, it changes linearly because we're not accelerating it upwards, and some constant. So again, you write your pressure at some location you know. Um, that location is known in terms of radius and elevation, and you solve for this. And then you choose another location which has different x, z, and r coordinates, and you use it there. Okay? So that might seem kind of complicated, but if we go back to the thing, um, the initial where we start off this week, these are the, the fundamental equations. These are the equations that you need. To, actually, you don't need this midterm round. You should have got an email right on 8 o'clock saying what the, is on the midterm. You don't need angular accelerations this time. Don't worry, switch off. We're still going to go through an example. But these are the two expressions that we just noted. How the surface changes and how pressure changes, say, along the base of the sample. I don't know what that is. And if you do that, uh, you solve for the constant and you solve for the distribution. Okay. So anyway, let's go quickly through an example, uh, just because I think it's instructive, because you've been bludgeoned with a bit of uh, math this morning, and so let's see exactly how we might do this. So imagine you're taking a, a baton and you're, you're twiggling around. You can imagine oh, a skipping rope. You swing a rope around your head, whether it has a, a weight on it or not, you know that there's a force exerted on your hand pulling your hand out because of the weight of the rope. If it has a weight on the end, it's accentuated, there's more tension. And so if you imagine that rope being made of water, exactly the same process occurs. So unflatten this tube. If you could stop the water from migrating out somehow, and you twiddled it around the center, then you'd expect there to be some tension in the, the tube close to the rotation axis. And it would be atmospheric at the top of the, the fluid at the outermost uh, reaches. If you then bend that into a U-tube, so we've taken the U-tube and we've bent it flat to do what I just said. If you bend it back into the U-tube, then you could imagine the same thing would happen, that you'd expect that as you twist it on its axis around this center line, that this is getting flung outside, and so it would want to generate tension in this particular central location. And the point of this question is kind of a cooler question, saying that if you spin it fast enough, how fast do you have to spin it before you vaporize the water here, before you blow, bring it down to its vapor pressure, which is almost absolute zero pressure. So it's minus 101 kilopascals per meter squared, kil kilonewtons per meter squared. And so that's the essence of this question. And so just in terms of looking in overview as how we do that, what do we do? How do we calculate what that is? Well, first of all, we have our expression that says how pressure changes as a function of radius. We need to figure out exactly what this constant is. So we choose to write the equation somewhere where we know it is. We know that on this point here, atmospheric atmosphere is acting. So this pressure has to be atmospheric. And so we know, if we take it as gauge pressure, we know that this is zero kPa gauge pressure. So we know pressure. We know that this location is at a radius of four inches. We presumably know a rotation speed. We know a density of fluid if it's water. And we know the elevation relative to some location is 12 inches. So we know this. And we know the unit weight of water, right? This is just rho g. And so we have everything we need here to be able to solve for the value of the constant. The constant, by definition, has to be in units of pressure, apples to apples. And so now we know exactly what the constant is. So what we can do now is that we know what this constant is. And so what we could do is we could write this. We know what this value is. Now we could write it at this point. We, could, we know at this point that the elevation is equal to 0. It was equal to 12 meter, 12 inches. We know at this point the radius is also equal to zero. Uh, but I guess we don't need to do that. What we can do is just 
put the, the magnitude in for the constant, and the magnitudes of the constant are equal to this amount here. These are the, this is the constant. This is the equation that we had before. So this is just rho v, this is, uh, yeah. Yeah, so you calculate the constant. It's equal to this amount here. And so now, the equation that we want to use is this. So this is a modification of this equation, allowing for the fact that we have the constant in, which is equal to this. So if you take this expression, rho omega squared um, and rho omega squared, we have two terms to add. We have r squared and 1. Two, I guess it's 2 over 9, 2 over 18. So this, this is eight, 1 over 9 with the 2 outside is equal to uh, the 1 over 18 term. And then we have the second expression, which is unit weight multiplied by z minus the constant that's here, which is 1. Right? So if you like, this equation here combined with this term here gives us this. And then now, this term is complete. There's no unknowns in this term except for pressure. We don't know what pressure is, but we know what, um, if we choose the rotation, the radius to be equal to zero, which is what this location is. If we choose the elevation equal to zero, which is what this is, then we know uh, everything except for the rotational speed that we have to apply to generate a pressure. If we know what the pressure is that we want, and the pressure we want will be the vapor pressure, which will be equal to, this is in um, uh, imperial units, so the vapor pressure is equal to something like, you see it down there, 0 0.256 psi absolute minus atmospheric pressure, and I'm going to run out of space, atmospheric pressure I think is 14.7 PSI. So this is positive, this ends up being negative, so it's, this is basically zero. This is almost zero. So it's almost equal to minus 14.7 PSI. You wouldn't be very wrong if you just used minus 14.7 PSI. So if you use minus 14.7 PSI for this, then you solve for this magnitude here. And that's it. Solution. And it turns out that you need to rotate it at some big number of radians per second to be able to do that. So it's important just to understand the, the process rather than numbers. So just again, the idea is we have an expression that defines pressure uh, everywhere in our system. We don't know what the constant is, but we can write the equation at a point where we do know the pressure and we know the coordinates in terms of r and z and solve for that constant. Once we have that constant, we can go back to this equation, or we can include it in this equation and make it a bit fancy. And then this equation doesn't have a constant anymore. It's an absolute equation, only for our particular system, but it's absolute. And then we can solve for other components of it. And this, all we're solving here is when is the pressure large enough in tension to be able to vaporize it, and it's pretty close to being negative gauge pressure. <laughs>